Okay, so let's uh, continue our discussions related to uh, PN junction diodes. And today's lecture, we look at uh, some common uh, and popular diode circuits and also look at uh, some uh, different types of diodes. Okay, so let's start with a very simple circuit. So we have a, a diode and a resistor in series. And when we apply a voltage uh, like this, and we would like to know the relationship between V out and V in. And so it's easy to see that V out versus V in, V out is over here and V in is here. V out versus V in will follow a characteristics like this. And the reason for this is that uh, when V in is small or even negative, let's say. So when V in is negative, it's obvious that the diode will be uh, reverse biased and will not carry much current. And therefore, the drop across uh, R1 is negligible and V out will be equal to V in. So that's why we see this uh, line of uh, slope equal to 1. Even when V in is positive, uh, strictly speaking, whenever we apply a positive, so there will be a positive voltage here, the diode will be forward biased. But let's look at the characteristics of the diode. And let's say for the sake of discussion, this is the characteristics shown here of this particular diode. Uh, the current is in log scale and this is the voltage across the diode. So let's say we are somewhere here. Let's say we have applied 240 millivolt. So at 240 millivolt, uh, the current across the diode is uh, one microampere. Uh, uh, current across the diode. So uh, the point is that when we have, when we have 240 uh, millivolt across the diode, the current is one microampere. So one microampere is multiplied by one K will give us one, one millivolt. So the output voltage here will, or the input voltage required would be 241 millivolt. So the output voltage is 240 and the input is 241, basically meaning V out is still equal to V in. So at this point, even though the diode is forward biased, but the uh, current through the diode is very small and V out is still equal to V in. Till we reach about uh, 0 0.6 or 0 0.7, when what happens is the diode becomes, uh, the conduction through the diode becomes significant. And now the bo bottleneck to current flow and uh, the, uh, this becomes the resistor R1, okay? So for example, uh, at uh, let's say uh, if I have five milliampers flowing through this particular circuit and I have five milliampers flowing through the circuit, so the drop here is five volt. And uh, at five milliampers, we can see here in this particular one, the drop across the diode is maybe 0.62 or so. Right, so the total voltage uh, is 5.62, out of which 5 volt is dropping here and 0.62 is dropping here. And uh, if the current uh, then, uh, let's say, doubles to 10 milliampers, so 10 milliampers, the drop here will become 10 volt, and the drop across the diode, we can see at 10 milliampers, the drop across the diode is maybe 0.65. So the overall input voltage is 10.65. Uh, so out of 10.65, 10 volt is dropping here and 0.65 is dropping here. So that's why we see that even though the output voltage is increasing, input voltage is increasing significantly, once the diode, once we start getting significant conduction through the diode, uh, the, uh, the voltage drop across the diode is not changing much because of this exponential characteristics here. So when you go from five to 10 milliampers, the change in diode voltage is uh, a, a couple of tens of millivolts here. All right, so then in a circuit like this, V out versus V in would be, V out will follow V in till significant conduction starts occurring in the diode at around 0.6 or 0.7, and then the output saturates, the output saturates here. And uh, if you want uh, this output to saturate at a different voltage, so that's easy to do. So this is our original circuit, and this is another circuit. So in this case, we've added a bias of one volt, and we can change the place, the voltage at which saturation occurs. So in this case, the saturation in the first circuit, saturation was occurring at uh, 0 0.6 or 0 0.7. In this case, by adding a one volt drop, we can change it to about 1.7 or 1.8. That's where the saturation occurs here, right? So V out versus V in is of this particular form, linear, linearly varying uh, uh, with V in and then saturating after a certain threshold value. And this threshold value is something that we can adjust by applying the bias here. All right, if we reverse the polarity of the diode, in this case, the diode was like this here. If we reverse the polarity of the diode, so the whole thing shifts now. 
So the saturation occurs in the negative direction and in the positive direction it, the output voltage follows linearly with the input voltage here because the diode is uh, either not conducting very well or reverse biased. So it follows like this here. Now we can combine the two circuits together. We can combine, we can have a diode here and the diode in this particular direction both. So this particular diode D2 will will cause the output to saturate in the positive direction. D1 will cause it to saturate in the negative direction here. So we expect the characteristics of this particular form here. And each one of those threshold points uh, from points minus 0.7 or plus 0.7, if you want to shift it, you can attach biases here. So for example, if we attach plus 1 and minus 1 here, we can shift it like this here. Now the saturation is occurring at around uh, minus 1.7 or so and plus 1.7 or so here, right? The saturation is occurring at that particular point. These circuits we call it as clipper circuits and uh, where such output follows the input but then beyond a certain threshold the output saturates and similarly in the negative direction the output follows the input but beyond a certain uh, threshold uh, the output saturates. We call them the clipper circuit for the following reason. Suppose instead of a DC now, I apply a sinusoid. So the input is a sinusoid. In this case, we are applying a 4-volt sinusoid here, the blue line, 4-volt sinusoid. So what will happen is uh, V out will follow V in till uh, this particular branch turns on at, uh, at around 1.7 uh, or so. So V out will follow V in. So that's what we see, the red graph, V out follows V in. But after about 1.7 volt or so, the output will saturate and so the output saturates here. So it's as if this, pos this part of the waveform, input waveform has been clipped. It has been removed uh, from the uh, output here. Similarly, in the negative direction, it follows the input here. But then when you reach this particular part here, then the output saturates here. And this portion of the waveform is clipped here. So these are uh, clipper circuits. And we can clip uh, at 1.7 or if you want to clip at 2.7, you change it to 2. And you can, by varying these biases, you can clip it at different uh, voltages that are there here. So these are useful uh, circuits. Uh, if you don't want, uh, uh, let's say, you, you know, uh, your device, let's say, can tolerate only maybe uh, 2 volt and beyond 2 volts, let's say, the device can get damaged or, or, or something of that sort may happen. So you can... Clip it at 2 volt here by applying, let's say, at 1.3 volt here, 0 0.7 and 1.3 will clip it at around 2 here. So these clipper circuits are useful and uh, you can do this uh, with the help of uh, diodes, that is, uh, di diodes that are there here. All right, so let's look at uh, another circuit, uh, a clamper circuit. So the idea here is as follows. Uh, so it's a capacitance in a resistance. In this case, this is, uh, let's first look at this simple circuit here which we recognize as a high pass filter. So let's apply a four volt sine omega t frequency of 100 Hertz. And the value of R and C have been chosen uh, such that you can calculate the time constant RC is uh, uh, 10 to the power three multiplied by 10 to the power minus four, so 0.1 second. And the frequency is considerably higher. And therefore, uh, in the available time, so the time period here is 10 to the power minus two second. So in the available and if the if the time constant is 0.1 second, it means that the capacitor is, will not be able to charge or discharge. And it's for that reason that the capacitor would practically act as, uh, trans will be transparent and V in will effectively pass through. Uh, or uh, in, in other ways, what you can say is that one over omega C, if you want to calculate one over omega C will be much smaller than a one K. And therefore the drop here is negligible. And that's why uh, we find the uh, out input is in blue and the output is in red and they superimpose in, on each other, right? So that's a high pass filter. But things become interesting if I add a diode to it. So let's add a diode in this direction here. So now uh, what would happen is in the positive direction, in the positive direction, what would happen is uh, the earlier the capacitor when the waveform goes positive the capacitor could not charge because the time constant was too small but now there is a diode here so uh, the moment the input voltage exceeds let's say 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 volt the diode starts conducting and once the diode starts conducting it provides a very low impedance path 
so the capacitor will charge up and will charge up to about if we take the drop across the diode as 0.6 or so so the it will charge up to about plus around uh, 3.4 volt or so now when you let's look at what happens then now when you go negative or or, or, or once the di once the capacitor has charged up to 3.4 here so let's look at uh, this behavior here so the blue curve shows the input right uh, plus 4 minus 4 here so that's the sinusoid that we're applying now what happens is uh, v out here so v out what happens is note that v out uh, the diode turns on and the output voltage is a constant uh, 0.7 here and uh, so 0.7 here so what happens is that this charges up to plus uh, uh, 3.4 uh, point, 0.6 or 0.7 here and 3.4 here so the capacitor charges up to that and then uh, in the uh, the capacitor then uh, retains that particular charge because once the input starts falling and going in the negative direction uh, the diode is reverse biased and even though there's a resistor but we've already seen the time constant is uh, too large so there is very little discharge of the capacitor so effectively it means v in minus v out is fixed to 3.4 or v out then becomes v in minus 3.4 so it's as if the whole graph that you see here, VE in the blue graph, is shifted down by 3.4 volts. If we had an ideal diode, this would have been uh, 4 volt and the whole graph would have been shifted down and the whole graph would have been, the whole curve would have been basically in the negative direction. So in that sense, a negative clamper. Alright, so this is what it shows here that initially, uh, this is the same graph initially but uh, diode current is so shown here. So the moment uh, the input voltage exceeds about 0.6, the diode starts conducting. The diode starts conducting here and the capacitance gets charged. Once the capacitance gets charged, the diode current falls to zero here. And the capacitance then almost retains this charge in the, in the, once the voltage is going down and it goes negative. There's a little bit of discharge through this R1 here. And in the next cycle, the diode turns on for a small while, short while to, to, to restore the capacitor uh, voltage here. Okay. All right, so uh, if we reverse the polarity of the diode, same thing happens, but then it becomes a positive clamper. So in this case, uh, the diode will start conducting in the negative direction and uh, uh, will charge up the capacitor to, uh, with this polarity shown here, uh, with minus 3.4. And then once it is charged up, the capacitor retains its uh, voltage and charge and so v in minus v out will be equal to minus 3.4 or v out will be equal to v in plus 3.4 so again if the diode had been ideal this would have been uh, minus 4 volt and this whole thing would have been v in plus 4 volt here so the whole graph would have been shifted up like you like you see here the blue one is the input and the whole graph has been shifted up in the positive direction here is a positive direction here and there's very little negative component the negative component is only the diode drop that you see here. And with the ideal di ideal diode, th there would have been no negative component uh, at all, and the entire voltage would have been positive. Okay, so that's a interesting circuit uh, where you can shift the whole graph in the positive direction uh, uh, such that there is no negative component at all or shift it in the negative direction such that there's no positive component at all. So you can do these things uh, with, with a capacitor and a resistor and a diode like this. This is a circuit that we had seen earlier. It's a peak detector circuit with a, simply with a diode and a capacitor here. And so the idea is again same uh, as the input. Uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say the capacitor is initially uncharged. So what happens is the input, uh, positive input here will turn the capacitor on and the capacitor will charge up and will charge up but the moment the input starts falling the diode is no longer conducting and the capacitor will retain its charge till the input again exceeds the uh, capacitor voltage here then again the capacitor will charge up and then uh, it will remain there during all this phase because the diode is reverse biased the capacitor voltage is larger than the input voltage here then again if the input uh, voltage happens to become larger than the capacitor voltage here, then again the, uh, the capacitor will charge up to that particular voltage here. So like that, the capacitor voltage follows the 
peak of the input here. So whatever is the peak voltage received so far, the capacitor voltage is uh, equal to it. If we assume that this is an ideal diode then. So this circuit then is a circuit which can find the peak value of, of the input voltage that is there. So it's a peak detector circuit. Uh, the next circuit is also interesting. Uh, it's a voltage doubler. So we have a sinusoid 10 volt sin omega t and from 10 volt sin omega t we'll generate a voltage output voltage which is a DC which is equal to 20 volt. Right. So uh, the circuit is shown here with a capacitor and a diode and a diode and another capacitor here and uh, this is the behavior of the circuit here. So again in blue we have the input and in red we have the output here. In red we have the output here. And in green, we have this particular intermediate node here. This green is this intermediate node here, all right? So the way, the way the circuit works is based on the two circuits that we have discussed earlier. This is a clamper circuit. So this clamper circuit, what it does is it shifts, remember it will shift the entire voltage in the positive direction. So whatever is the input 10 volt sine omega t, it will shift it up by, uh, if we neglect the diode drop, shift it up by, 10 volts here so that the entire voltage is positive. So that's what is happening at this node here, the green node that is almost positive here. The whole thing has been shifted here. So it has been shifted up by uh, almost like 10 volt here. So it starts from zero and goes up to 20. And it's not exactly 20 because of the diode drops and uh, that are there here. If, if we had ideal drops, ideal diodes, it would have gone up to 20 here. And uh, we can see getting very close to 20. Uh, after a few cycles here. And uh, so that's a clamper, so it's shifting up. And the, this part of the circuit is nothing but peak detector that we just saw. So it, it uh, so once you have a, have a waveform which goes from zero to 20, and this one is a peak detector circuit here, so it, it detects the peak value, which is 20, and therefore gives you a 20 volt output here. So, so from 10 volts to, uh, we are able to get a 20 volt, uh, DC value here. Okay, so that's uh, using a clamper and a peak detector. If you're wondering whether we can make a tripler or a quadrupler, the answer is yes, we can do that. So this is the circuit of a voltage tripler. And uh, so uh, to understand the circuit, note that we already had this circuit which was a voltage doubler that we just discussed. And so the idea in this circuit is that uh, instead of a ground here, if we can if we can take the ground and instead of that uh, let's say your your input is 10 and you want 30 volt so this circuit is already doing 20 volt taking 10 and converting into 20 but it means if instead of ground if if i can add a 10 volt here so if this is 10 volt so this is 20 volt was with respect to ground so instead of that if i can uh, connect these to a 10 volt here then the output would be 30 volts here so that is what is done in this circuit Note that the ground connection has been removed and this, uh, this part has been connected to this part of the circuit here, right? And what will this part of the circuit do? Note that in the positive, the moment I go in the positive uh, cycle here, this part of the diode will turn on. And if you assume that uh, uh, the diode drop is negligible, this node will charge up to 10 volt. And once it charges up to 10 volt, it's, it's not going to discharge because the discharge path is either through this and uh, the discharge path is not available. So this is what happens here. It takes a few cycles for, for this to happen here. So note that it is going towards uh, uh, 30 volt. Again, because of uh, we don't have perfect diodes, so there are drops here, so it doesn't reach the full 30 volts that you see here. But if we had ideal diodes, this would have gone up to 30 volts or so. Okay, so this is a voltage uh, tripler circuit. All right, uh, let's shift gear and look at uh, another aspect of the diode. So, so far we've, we've been relying on the fact that uh, the diode is a rectifier uh, passing current in one direction and uh, blocking the flow of current in the reverse direction here. In this case, if we examine the diode characteristics, uh, we note that the diode characteristics is temperature dependent. And one temperature dependent is obvious, Vt, the thermal voltage is Kt by Q here. Uh, there's a direct temperature dependence. And the other one is in this particular term here, IS. The saturation current, the reverse saturation current is also highly temperature dependent. 
And one can show that the IS is dependent on intrinsic carrier concentration in silicon. And it, it has a note that it has an exponential dependence on temperature. So uh, if you increase temperature, IS will note that e to the power minus here. So if you increase temperature, intrinsic carrier concentration in the device increases rapidly. And uh, therefore, the saturation current also increases rapidly. So there are two terms. This term is increasing with temperature. Uh, and will try to cause this particular term to decrease. But with the increase in temperature, this term increases. And it turns out that this term is dominant. And therefore, uh, if you bias a diode at a fixed, temperature, fixed uh, voltage here, and you raise the temperature, then the diode current will increase. Right? And, uh, uh, or in other way, what we can do is, we can take a diode and bias it at a fixed current. So if we do that, then the diode voltage is Vd equal to Vt ln I0 by Is plus 1 here. And one of the common mistakes that makes one, one writes down a diode expression like this is we can see Vt and we, and we, and we think that with increase in temperature, the diode uh, voltage should increase with temperature. But as we just said, Is is the dominant term here. Uh, this is also uh, uh, significant, but Is, oh, the effect of Is overcomes this particular effect here. So the diode voltage actually decreases here because as you increase the temperature, uh, this term increases significantly and this term then uh, decreases significantly. And for silicon diodes, a sort of uh, uh, an empirical law or a rule of thumb is that the diode voltage decreases at the rate of around uh, minus 2 millivolt per degree Celsius. So for every 1 degree increase in temperature, the diode voltage will drop by minus 2 millivolt if you bias it at a fixed current. So for example, if the diode voltage is 0.7 at uh, 27 degrees Celsius, which we take as room temperature, then at 100 degrees Celsius, the diode drop would be 0.7 minus 2 millivolt and the excess temperature over room, which is 100 minus 27, so it will be only 0.554. Right, so at that particular point, so if you're wondering where would I encounter 100 uh, degrees Celsius, well, there are circuits which are used, uh, let's say, in an automobile uh, uh, where temperatures uh, can, can rise. Uh, even in a uh, microprocessor uh, circuits, because of a lot of power dissipation, the internal chip temperature could be 70 degrees, 80 degrees. Uh, it could be of that particular level. Okay, So this is something that we need to be aware of, that the drop across the diode will change with temperature and as the drop changes then it will have a consequence for other parts of the circuit the current may change or or uh, other things uh, may vary in the circuit here but we can take advantage of this fact that the diode characteristics is temperature dependent and uh, we can make a thermometer so let's see how we can do that so we take this characteristics id equal to is exponent vd by vt minus one and let's say we make a circuit like this. We take a diode D1, we pass a current I1 through it. And the voltage drop will be, Vd1 will be equal to Vt ln I1 by Is plus 1. Okay, so that's fine. Let's take another uh, circuit. And let's take an identical diode. A diode which characteristics is identical to this one. And we pass a current I2. So the drop here will be Vd2 will be Vt ln I2 by Is plus 1 here. So now we take these two voltages, diode voltages, Vd1 and Vd2, and we pass it through what we call as a difference amplifier. So this amplifier will take the difference of the voltages applied at, at the positive and the negative terminal and generate an output which is equal to the difference of the two multiplied by the gain of the amplifier. So let's do that here. Let's connect them up. So the output here, V0 will be equal to C, Vd2 minus Vd1. So let's subtract the two together. So once we subtract, we get V0 equal to C, K by Q, ln, I2 by I1, multiplied by T. And note that all the terms are constant. C is related to the gain of the amplifier, Boltzmann constant, charge, the ratio of the currents, I2 by I1, we could make it 20 or 100 or so. So everything is fixed which means that I get an output voltage which is directly proportional to the absolute temperature. And uh, uh, by calibration, 
uh, we can figure out what is this particular constant and thereby our circuit can measure the temperature of, uh, of, of uh, any, uh, any uh, object that is there in contact with it. So the object of course has to be in contact with the diodes that are there here, the two diodes. And if the object is in contact, the diode will reach a temperature equal to the object temperature here and the output voltage will be then proportional to the absolute value of the temperature here. So there are uh, electronic thermometers uh, which are uh, uh, based on this particular principle we, which, we, which uh, exploit the uh, diode characteristics. Uh, the, uh, there are um, uh, circuits which contain multiple diodes and uh, analysis of those diodes become, of those circuits become uh, interesting and also uh, a little bit involved. So let's take a circuit like this here. So we have D1 and D2 and we have uh, voltage V2 here, minus 5, 10K, V1 here and 5K here. And what we are looking for is this relationship between V0 and Vn. Now, when we have multiple diodes or even when we have a single diode, the issue is, is the diode forward or reverse bias? So when we have two diodes, there are various possibilities. Both diodes can be reverse bias, D1 can be forward and D2 can be reverse or vice versa or both can be uh, reverse biased or both can be forward biased. So these four possibilities exist and uh, it's not that all four possibilities uh, will always occur in a circuit but uh, these are the four things that need to be explored. So in this case, uh, what would be V0 versus Vn? Well, V0 versus Vn would follow a graph like this here. Okay, so how do we arrive at that? So uh, if we examine this particular circuit here, uh, let's look at, so we start off V in, which is, let's say, let's say the problem asks, what is V0 versus V in? As V in is uh, taken from minus five to let's say plus uh, 10 or so. So from minus five to plus 10. So let's say V in is minus five. So V in is minus five here is highly negative and if we examine this uh, circuit this part of the circuit so let's assume that d1 is off for a moment if we examine and check whether uh, this is really true or not so we have 5 volt here and 5k here and we have 10 and minus 5 so we note that this voltage would be higher than this particular voltage here because we have 5 uh, passing through 5k here and you have minus 5 going through 10k here so this voltage will be more than this particular voltage here and so the voltage here would be positive because you have 5 here and minus 5 here the the influence of this 5 volt positive voltage would be higher so the voltage will be positive and on this side is negative so the diode is d1 is reverse biased and if it is reverse biased then obviously there's no impact of v in so v naught will be constant so this is what what we initially see d1 is off and d2 is on and uh, and and the voltage is constant this will stay and we can calculate what is this voltage here. We can calculate the voltage here uh, at around uh, till about, uh, this will happen till, uh, till we reach uh, a voltage of 1.7. Because uh, uh, note that uh, once you reach a voltage of 1.7 and we are taking 0.7 volt drop here, so the voltage here will become 1.2. And uh, this side is uh, on so this side is still 1.9 here, right? So when V in reaches 1.7, D2 is already on, D1 also turns on. And D1 also turns on, so now what happens is uh, D1 is on and D2 is also on. And therefore, uh, this, this node here will basically follow V in. Why? This node will basically follow V in because once the diode is uh, conducting significantly, the voltage across it is, is relatively constant. So, which we are taking it as 0.7. So, the, this node here then follows V in, and this node and this node are also related through the diode drop here. Okay, so if this is V in, this point is V in minus 0.7, and this voltage will be V in minus 0.7 plus 0.7, so it's equal to V in. So, V naught follows V in here. And this will continue to occur till when V0 reaches 5 volt, the D2 will also turn off. Because when V0 reaches uh, 5 volt here, 
uh, if this reaches 5 volt, which means this is about 4.3. So when you have 4.3 here, there's not enough voltage to turn this particular diode on, or it's just at the threshold. So D2 turns off, and once D2 turns off, again V0 is disconnected from V in, so it becomes constant. V0 is disconnected from V in, and V0 is simply equal to the voltage that is coming from here. All right, so when we have multiple diodes and resistors and voltage supplies, uh, things become interesting and uh, the analysis becomes uh, a little bit involved. Uh, but at any time, you can, you can assume that a particular diode is uh, on or off and uh, start on that particular basis and then you can check whether your assumption is correct or not. So as an example, uh, we can take, uh, okay, so that's the summary. D1 is off, D2 is on. Both of them are on. D1 is on and D2 is off here. Okay, so the next circuit is over here. And in this case, uh, uh, V in is here, D1, and, and, and this part of the characteristics is shown. And we have to, uh, so the output voltage versus input will follow a graph of uh, this particular kind here. So note that when the voltage is uh, negative, the voltage is negative here. So both diodes, this diode will be on here and this diode will be on because of this 5 volt here. And I will leave it to you to verify this. Both diodes are initially on as V in increases eventually D2 turns off. As V in increases here, D2 turns off. As V in further increases, eventually D in also turns off. So this is what is happening here. Anyway, so that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, one needs to figure out which diodes are on and which diodes are off at, uh, uh, at different uh, voltages. And based on that, one needs to uh, draw here, draw the characteristics here. Okay, so one starts from, uh, let's say, highly negative value here and then figures out that both D1 and D2 is on and therefore this is constant. And then one finds out at what point this condition then stops to occur. And uh, one will see then that D2 is turning. Uh, as you make V1, uh, V in more and more positive, D2 will eventually turn off here. All right, so let's look at some uh, other diode types. So Zener diode is a, is a very interesting diode and that is commonly employed in uh, uh, whenever we need a constant voltage drop uh, somewhere in the circuit here. So it's a diode specially designed to operate in reverse bias and in the breakdown region here. So normally uh, we operate many diodes in the forward bias and in the reverse bias we stay in this particular region. But Zener diode is a diode that is specifically designed to operate. Well, you can operate it here, you can operate it here also. But the advantage of Zener diode is that you can operate it here. Normal diodes, you should not go into the breakdown mode because uh, uh, uncontrollable amounts of current may flow and they may get damaged. So for normal diodes, we stay in this region here and we stay in this region. But Zener diode, we take advantage of this particular part here. And uh, the advantage of this particular part is that the diode is in the breakdown mode and this part of the characteristics is very, very sharp. And so very sharp here, so you can see that the voltage is almost constant, even though uh, variable amounts of current may be flowing here. The current could be 1 milliampere, the current could be 10 here, the current could be 50 here, but the drop is almost the same. So Zener diode in this place acts like a constant voltage drop uh, device here. And this voltage here is what we call as the Zener voltage here. So, uh, so Zener diodes will be, you know, when you, if you want to purchase Zener diodes, you will purchase it according to, for example, the different kinds of Zener voltages. You can get three volt Zener voltage, three, four, five, I'll just show you a data sheet. And uh, this part is ideally a vertical line, but in practice, uh, it has a certain slope here. So it has a certain resistance here. So the slope is del I by del V will be equal to RZ, which is the uh, resistance of the uh, Zener diode in, in this particular region here. So this is the symbol of the Zener diode here. So, uh, to distinguish it from regular PN junction diode. And note that uh, uh, Zener diode will conduct current in the reverse direction 
if the voltage across the zener diode is uh, equal to Vz or, or a little larger than Vz. Okay. But if you are in this region, the zener diode will be like a normal diode with uh, basically with practically like an open circuit. And in forward direction, the zener diode is like a normal p-n junction diode. Okay, so we think of zener diode, once you are in that vertical region, steep region here, we think of zener diode as almost like a constant voltage, uh, like a battery. The drop across it is a constant, so we model it. Electrically, we model it like this. And if you want to be more accurate, you can include a resistor RZ also. So many times to keep our analysis simple and because RZ is pretty small, we'll neglect that and we'll model Zener diode uh, as a battery of, of a value equal to Vz. Note the polarity that is there here. And But you have to make sure that you are in the uh, uh, breakdown mode here. Okay, so that, that is something that we need to do. it. So for example, if we look at 10 volt here, let's look at the circuit. We have 10 volt, we have an R and we have a Zener diode connected. So it's obvious that, uh, note that the diode is reverse biased. The 10 volt will reverse bias the diode. Are we in that uh, breakdown mode or not? If you're not in the breakdown mode, if you're not in the breakdown mode, then the current would be negligible, I would be zero, and therefore this entire 10 volt will come here. Now, Zener voltage is 5.6, so we know that we will go into the breakdown mode, right? So it is operating in the breakdown mode, and in the breakdown mode, what will the Zener diode act like? basically like a battery of a value 5.6, right? So the current that will flow is the 10 volt minus Vz by R. And, uh, uh, you know, if Vz is 5.6 and uh, and you want a current of, uh, let's say, 3 milliampers, right? So then you can find out you have to connect 1.47 kilo. And there would be a power, note that uh, normal diodes uh, in the reverse bias, they don't have any, they have very little current, so there's very little power dissipation. In the forward bias, uh, they have a lot of current flowing through them, but the voltage drop across uh, the diode is small, and uh, therefore uh, the power dissipation is also not that large. It is significant, but it's not that large because the diode drop is small. But in the Zener diode case, uh, the the voltage across the Zener diode is significant, 5.6, and there may be significant current flowing here. So the power dissipation in Zener diode becomes important. And we need to make sure that the power dissipation in Zener doesn't exceed the uh, rating that the manufacturer has provided. So these are examples of some Zener diodes that I've shown over here. Note that there are a variety of Zener diodes. So power dissipation is, is uh, uh, limited to, for example, for all these uh, class of Zenas, power dissipation is limited to one watt. And uh, let's look at the characteristics, some of the Zener. So note that you can get a Zener diode with 3.3 volt, 3.6, 3.9, continuously 10, 11, 12. You can get all kinds of Zener diodes that are there here. And note that the Zener resistance is 7 ohms, 8 ohms, 9 ohms, small resistance that is there here. Okay, There are other characteristics, but let's not worry about it. So the important characteristics of Zener diode is the Zener voltage, obviously, Vz. The other one is there is a maximum current uh, uh, that uh, the manufacturer will list here. If we go back here, Note that there's a maximum current IZ maximum that has been written there here, yeah, right? So every Zena will have some maximum current. Beyond that, the device may get damaged here. So IZ maximum. There's a minimum current also. Because if you go, note that the characteristics has a slight curvature here. If you go below a certain minimum current, you're no longer in this steep region here. And the Zener diode will not behave like a like a constant voltage here and here, you know, there may be a, a significant variation in voltage here. So there's a, uh, and, and it's no longer in this, in this uh, uh, constant voltage drop uh, case here. So there's a minimum current also. And as we just discussed, there's a power also here. So when you're using a Zener diode, you have to make sure for whatever application that you've chosen, Vz as uh, proper, Iz maximum and Iz minimum, you have to make sure that your circuit uh, is not uh, allowing current to exceed this value and neither sh should the current fall below this value otherwise the zener will not act like a like a battery of vz or so maybe the voltage drop of vz note that i'm using the word battery is not a source of power 
battery only in the sense battery is a constant voltage uh, element here. So the word battery is being used only as a, uh, as, 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 it's, it's only a model to indicate that the drop across the Zener diode is, is, is constant here, Vz. And you have to make sure that the, uh, you don't exceed the power uh, dissipation in the Zener diode. So power dissipation in the Zener diode will be equal to Vz multiplied by at whatever current you are, uh, whatever current between these two limits uh, that are there, you have to make sure that uh, that is obeyed also. So a very simple circuit with a Zener diode, with a resistor and a Zener diode like this here. So note that in the positive cycle, so this is the input here in blue. In the positive part here, as long as the voltage, input voltage is less than, the Zener voltage is three volt. So as long as it is less than three volt, the Zener diode does not conduct. It's in reverse bias and therefore V out equal to Vn. So output voltage in red follows the input voltage here. The moment the input exceeds the Zener uh, voltage of uh, three volt, the Zener diode acts as a con constant voltage uh, element here of three volt here. So it is fixed here, three volt. Here. And the moment the input falls below three here, the, then we are no longer in the Zener mode of operation. So uh, it acts again as an open circuit and uh, the output uh, follows the input. Once I go in the negative direction, then the diode is forward biased. And in the forward bias, we have seen that at around uh, this circuit begins to clip at around minus 0.6 or so. So this is what is happening here. Once it is gets significantly forward bias, the output will become fixed at minus 0.6 or minus 0.7 or so, and will stay there. Okay. And uh, in terms of V out versus V in, we have a curve like this here. So it is clipping. If you if you want to think of it. It's uh, clipping at around uh, Zener voltage of three. In the negative direction is clipping at uh, minus uh, 0.7 or so. All right, another kind of a diode which we are all familiar with are called light emitting diodes. So we are familiar with, we have a red light emitting diode and a green and a white. If we open up, if we remove this particular case, we'll see a, uh, a piece of uh, semiconductor, uh, which is basically a diode and that semiconductor is biased as you can see here one side is anode and the other side is cathode here so that passes current and it's the current which gets converted into light here so it's basically a pn junction diode so let's see how it operates so this is the picture that we had used earlier we have a pn junction diode this is a depletion region p region has a lot of holes and we have a lot of electrons so if we forward bias it we had seen that the holes are injected into the N region, the holes find a lot of electrons and the holes will recombine with the electron here. And when the holes recombine with the electron, what happens is a photon is emitted. Because when an electron falls into the conduction ba uh, valence band, it gives this energy as a photon. Similarly, the electron here may go here, will recombine with the hole, and again you get a photon, right? So what, what is happening is the electrons are falling into the hole here, and you're getting a photon. The excess energy that was there is released in the form of a photon here. Right? And so the, uh, it's basically the energy gap, EG, which decides the wavelength of the light or the, uh, of the light which is emitted that is uh, there, here, right? So, uh, PN, so uh, a, a, a silicon uh, PN junction diode does not emit light. One has to use, uh, uh, other materials, uh, for example, there are semiconductors which are called compound semiconductors made up of two different elements such as gallium arsenide and, uh, uh, you know, so one has to use uh, some uh, uh, other kinds of uh, semiconductors to get light output here. And uh, uh, so this was the person, uh, Nick Holoniak, uh, who invented the first LED. This was in 1962 and it was a red LED using a compound semiconductor called uh, gallium arsenide phosphide here. And I've put his picture up because he was also to honor my teacher when I was a student at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign doing my PhD. I took two courses with him on related to light emitting diodes. So, uh, and he also, he himself happens to be student of uh, uh, John Bardeen who invented the transistor. And so Nick Holoniak invented the LED in 1962, 
So uh, what he invented was red LED. And after that, uh, you know, uh, uh, yellow and orange LEDs were invented. But people had a hard time developing blue LEDs. And it almost took uh, 30 years for blue LEDs to be developed. And the person who's credited with that invention is Shuji Nakamura. So blue LED and the blue LED, remember we said it depends on the band gap uh, of the semiconductor, the wavelength of light. So a higher band gap material, gallium nitride, uh, he used. And a lot of people had been working with gallium nitride, but uh, the making blue LEDs was really hard. Uh, but he, he was able to do that. And in 1992, so almost uh, 30 years passed. And uh, for that particular invention, he got a Nobel Prize in 2014. Um, mainly because, uh, you know, if you want to use LEDs for a lighting purpose, lighting at home, uh, you need a white light. And white light is uh, commonly made by combining a blue with a yellow. Uh, or you, you need uh, all three colors, red, green and blue. So this blue and green was missing and uh, red and orange kind of a LED was available. And uh, when he came up with this blue LED and also green LED, then it became possible to develop white LEDs. Uh, and, and that's where the lighting revolution, the replacement of uh, bulbs by LEDs began uh, because of his invention. And because of the importance uh, of his invention to the field of lighting, uh, he was honored with the Nobel Prize in 2014. Uh, let's look at another application or another uh, very, very important application, which is that PN junction can also act as a solar cell. In fact, the common PN junctions that we see, uh, common solar cells that you see are all uh, PN junctions. And so this is the picture of uh, solar radiation. And in yellow, we have the solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere, outside the atmosphere here. And it's pretty much, uh, you can see here, the gray one is a black body uh, radiation curve here. So the sunlight at the top of the atmosphere pretty much follows a black body radiation with a temperature of around 5,000 degrees Celsius. But then as the sunlight goes through the atmosphere, it gets absorbed, scattered, and what reaches the surface is this red graph that you see here. So it's, it's not only has a reduced intensity, note that this is in uh, amount of radiation is being measured in watts per meter square of the area per nanometer because it's a spectrum, so per nanometer of the wavelength here. And so you have all these uh, absorptions occurring due to uh, water and oxygen, so you have these uh, uh, dips that you see here. So the red one is the actual uh, uh, radiation which reaches the Earth's surface here. Note that a lot of radiation is in the infrared region here. A significant amount lies in the infrared, in, in something which is uh, not visible here. And in the UV region, the radiation is, is, uh, is fairly small, so it is invisible and it's in the infrared region. Now, uh, for the purpose of uh, analysis and the, for, for the purpose of calibration, we have different standards uh, for solar radiation. Now, we use the phrase AM0, air mass zero, uh, to denote the intensity of radiation, uh, solar radiation uh, outside the atmosphere. Okay, AM0 here. And so that's, that's about 1367 uh, watts per meter square. The total amount of power or power intensity which is incident is equal to 1367. When the solar radiation goes straight, normal, uh, straight through the atmosphere, normal to the atmosphere here, we call this AM 1.0, air mass 1. And this radiation, air mass 1, is 925 watts per meter square. Now typically, the, you know, the sun is not directly overhead, the, uh, the rays will come at an angle. So they go through more of the atmosphere. And as they go through more of the atmosphere, they get absorbed more and the power decreases here. So one common standard is AM 1.5 and the power that is available is 844 watts per meter square. That's 48.2. Something that comes at an even greater angle, 60.1, that's AM 2, which is 691 watts per meter square. So many times uh, when uh, uh, the data on solar cells is being reported, 
the data is reported for AM 1.5 as a standard, that uh, the amount of radiation that is there, uh, when, you, when somebody says, uh, this is the characteristics of a solar cell under AM 1.5, so the person is meaning that under AM 1.5, there's 844 watts per meter square available. Uh, that is the here. So uh, solar cell, uh, as we said, is a p-n junction. So there's a p-type and an n-type. And uh, so what happens is the principle is very simple. We have a sun and the photon comes from the sun and the photon gets absorbed in the material. And in this case, it generates. In the previous case, the LED was based on recombination. In this case, it's based on generation. So you create an electron hole pair. And the hole goes to the anode. The electron goes to the cathode here. And if you complete the circuit and you want to light up a bulb, the current would flow and uh, will light up the bulb here. Okay. Except that uh, this picture is flawed. Uh, a single uh, p-n junction uh, will generate only uh, 0.5 or, uh, volts or so, or uh, 0.5 volt or even less. And 0.5 volt will not light up a lamp like this, right? This kind of a lamp will require uh, hundreds of volts uh, to light up. So this picture is only uh, just for the sake of illustration and a single solar cell cannot uh, light it up. But you can imagine that we can connect several solar cells in series and uh, then we may be able to light up a bulb. All right, so solar cell is a diode and the diode we have already seen diode characteristics is like this here, I versus V. But then solar cell is not a regular diode. There's a light falling on the solar cell and the light is generating photons. So basically it's generating a current. So we should think of a solar cell as this diode along with the current source here. And this current source that is there here is because of the incident light. So this diode along with the, this current source is what is a solar cell. And we can connect a load RL uh, note that we don't bias, uh, this is a source of uh, uh, power and uh, so if we connect a load here, then uh, this current here, part of the current will, will be absorbed here, but a significant part can flow over here. So the characteristics of the solar cell then is, is shown in this particular graph here. That's how the solar cell will look like. And it's easy to see why it will be like this. So if I shot, if I put RL equal to zero, V equal to zero, so this entire current would flow through this here and uh, current going in this direction, we are calling it, let's say, negative. And uh, if we make RL equal to infinity, uh, then this current I is zero, and then this entire current would flow through the diode here. And uh, when this current is significant, so this, this voltage around here will be equal to around 0.7 or so, or 0.7 or 0.6 or so. So this point will be 0.6 here, and this one will depend on uh, how much intensity of the light is uh, falling. All right, so this is, uh, this is just the opposite. Uh, this part should be VOC here. This part should be VOC and this part should be ISC here. So short circuit current here and open circuit voltage here. So make that correction. And uh, all right, so this is the characteristics of the solar cell then, okay? And uh, so let's... Uh, um, uh, let's make let's make the correction here. Well, all right. So it's a bit difficult right now. So let's keep it as it is. So this is VOC and this is ISC. So obviously you cannot operate the solar cell here. If you operate the solar cell here, there is a current in the solar cell, but the voltage is zero, so there's no power. Neither can you operate it here. There's a voltage across the solar cell, but there's no current. So you operate somewhere here. Uh, you know, you try to find out where can you extract the maximum power? So let's say this is the optimum point, Vm into Im. So that's the power which is extracted from here. So normally what we do is we write this as Vm into, uh, if we are talking about power density, power per unit area, then we use current density. So Vm into Jm, and we can divide it by Voc into Jsc multiplied by Voc into Jsc. So this first factor is what is called as the fill factor. We'll not go into the details. So the power extracted from a, uh, from a PN junction is equal to open circuit voltage, the point here, short circuit uh, current, the point here, and the fill factor. So let's look at an example here. So this is an example of a silicon solar cell under AM 1.5 radiation. 
So you can get a current of 43 milliampers per centimeter square. 43 milliampers per centimeter square. The VOC is 0.769. We said, you know, almost like 0.7 volt or so, so 0.769. And the fill factor is 89% uh, or uh, otherwise 0.89. So if we calculate the uh, power that we can extract, if we take JSC here, VOC here, and multiply by fill factor, 43 to 0.769. So we get about 29.4 milliwatt of power we can, if 100 milliwatt of uh, incident power is there, our solar cell will be able to generate 29.4 milliwatt here, about one third of the power. The remaining two thirds of the power is either not absorbed or is wasted at uh, various other places here. And this is one of the, uh, uh, you know, we are talking about a highly efficient solar cell. Most solar cells would be considerably less than that. In fact, uh, this is an older data. The best silicon solar cell is like 24%. And the common solar cells uh, would have uh, even lesser. The ones that one can purchase in the market are even lesser. So note that a single solar cell, if VOC is about 0.769, and if you're operating it here, maybe a single solar cell will generate only 0.6 volt here. And if you want higher uh, values, obviously, then you have to connect several solar cells in series to increase the voltage. And if you want more current, you'll have to connect them in parallel. So a single solar cell is seldom used. You use uh, a number of solar cells connected in series and parallel, and we call them solar modules. So these are shown here, several solar cells connected in series and connected in parallel. So you get all these modules that are there here, and these modules may be able to generate uh, voltages in uh, maybe 12 volt or so, and generate uh, sufficient power for practical application. Now, if you're wondering how much power can I generate in Kanpur? Well, uh, so the data is shown here for different cities in UP here. So in Kanpur, for example, uh, uh, effectively what you get is the amount of radiation that you get varies being less in January and more in uh, May obviously here 6.54 so this is in kilowatt how much energy uh, solar energy is available per day so in kilowatt hours per day per meter square all right so if you take one meter square of let's say solar area and uh, per day, so on an average in Kanpur, you'll get about 4.89 kilowatts. That's the amount of radiation that is falling. And an 18% efficient solar panel would then generate about 0.9 kilowatt hour. Yeah. So if you took a solar panel, uh, which covered an area of one meter square, uh, you may be able to get one kilowatt hour on an average uh, uh, per day. That's the kind of power that is there here. All right, so uh, PN junction uh, also acts like a photodiode or a detector. And that's also uh, extremely important because light uh, is used for communication. Fiber optic cables are everywhere. And uh, much of high speed internet that we enjoy is uh, because of uh, fiber optic based uh, communication. And uh, photodiodes, uh, PN junctions as photodiodes or detectors play a very important role. So photodetectors is a specially designed reverse bias PN jun uh, junction, which is used to detect light here. So you have a PN junction and is designed to increase the depletion region here. Depletion region width here. So we'll not go into the details. Uh, note that it is reverse biased. And uh, so the idea is uh, uh, when you have light coming in, light gets absorbed just like in a solar cell. But the purpose here is different. There, in a solar cell, your purpose was to generate power. In this case, you have very, very low levels of light falling onto your device and you want to detect it. You want to detect what is the intensity of the light here. So this, uh, so the light falls in, you have electron hole pairs and the available electric field will make the hole go to the P region, electron go to the N region and you get a current flowing in the circuit here. And the current will be proportional to the light intensity that is falling here. All right, so if you have a photodiode like this here, you could bias it in the reverse bias direction like 12 volt if you apply. When no light is falling, then uh, the current through the diode is negligible. The output voltage is 12 volt. But when you shine light, when you shine light, there will be a current flow through it and the voltage will maybe drop to 11 volts or so, depending on your biasing. And thereby you can find out uh, 
uh, you can detect the presence of the light and also uh, you can quantify how much light is falling. All right, so let's uh, stop here.